The only easy day was yesterday. Welcome to The Only Easy Day Was Yesterday, the official Navy SEAL podcast. On May 24, 2018, Navy SEAL Senior Chief Britt Slavinsky was invited to the White House and presented with the Medal of Honor. He was awarded the nation's highest military honor for his actions in 2002 when he led his team on a daring rescue mission to save their teammate who was wounded behind enemy lines. In this episode, Senior Chief Slavinsky talks about the importance of team mentality when facing adversity and what service means to him. Get your heads up, get your eyes open, stop trying to hide from the pain. Heads up, eyes open. Thank you for sharing some of your time with us, for one. That's, it means a lot, I think, to have your perspective voice in on the podcast. So thank you for sharing some of your time with us to start with. Certainly happy to be here. For people that might not know you, if you could just briefly introduce yourself and tell us your history with the Navy. Yeah, certainly. So I am Britt Slabinski. I am a retired Command Master Chief, served 26 years, mostly all of that, in the SEAL teams, and um, mostly all East Coast teams. Uh, went through with Bud's class 164, uh, graduated with that in January 1990, and then uh, served with SEAL Team 4 for a few years, and then served to, uh, with Naval Special Warfare Development Group, then served at Group 2 as a Command Master Chief, and then uh, retired from uh, Naval Special Warfare Command. In March of 2002, um, deployed to Afghanistan in January 2002, but in March of that year, conducted an operation called Operation Anaconda, where I led a seven-man reconnaissance team uh, onto a snow-covered 11,000-foot mountain peak to conduct uh, overwatch operations, reconnaissance operations. During that operation, one of my teammates, upon landing or helicopter landing on top of the mountain, we received heavy RPG, rocket propelled grenade fire, machine gun fire, damaged the helicopter badly, and one of my teammates uh, was ejected from the aircraft. Uh, uh, teammate's name was Neil Roberts. So my helicopter crash landed in the valley, and uh, I made the decision to launch an immediate rescue mission with my remaining team members back up to the mountain, up against superior numbers, heavily armed enemy force, and for those actions during that day, I was awarded the Medal of Honor. And I understand that just happened recently as far as um, receiving the award, is that correct? It did. It happened May 24th at a ceremony at the White House. Presented, oh, wow. so just, yeah, yeah, presented not too long ago at yeah, all. Not too long ago at that all. Must have been pretty, that must have been pretty amazing um, it, it, experience. It, it was. It is still, still very surreal. I don't even think surreal is the right word yeah, for right. it, but it is still very, very surreal. Amazing experience indeed. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, tough to wrap your mind around, I'm sure. It's yeah, like it still is. So let's rewind back to joining the Navy. What or who inspired you to do that? So I think like most youth graduating from high school, I'm trying to figure out what do I want to do with my life. And from an early age on, I was involved in Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts was the kind of the foundation of my life. And I became an Eagle Scout. Uh, and from what I learned in scouting, that really became the foundation of my life. Boy Scout Oath, Boy Scout Law, those things are what I made decisions from. They were vitally important to me growing up and still are to, to this day. My father uh, was also a UDT guy. So he was in Naval Special Warfare really back in the early days. He, w he went through one of the beginning classes of it, class 13 back in the early 1950s. Wow, wow. So when I was around 13, 14 years old, my dad took me to a SEAL reunion to where he introduced me to some of his teammates. And from that moment on, I, I thought, wow, he's introduced me to this other family that he had and I thought, this looks like something very interesting that I want to do. Very difficult job, difficult selection process for the job, but very crucial, important work on behalf of the nation. So retiring from high school, I made the decision that I wanted to do something that was more important for me to do. I wanted to contribute. I wanted to serve my nation. And for me, that was joining the Navy and then applying to go to the SEAL program. Did you know what you wanted to do with the SEALs whenever you first joined? I know at that point there might not have been nearly as much media coverage about what the teams even did, but 
Did you have an idea of kind of what you wanted to do in yeah. the teams? I certainly did because my dad introduced me to it. I'm from Northampton, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. so Western Massachusetts. So as you can imagine, there wasn't a big presence right. of military there. So I would not have known of the SEALs, probably let alone even the Navy, other than my, my father introducing me to it. So really happy to have this opportunity to, to get this message out to, to... Yeah, other people in the same predicament. Yeah, or good, the there same. are other people right. there. And, just to, to help them focus, hey, what do you want to do with your life? Right, right, right. I kind of set, set off on the right path. What did you do in the SEAL teams as your specialty? Coming through SEAL training, you're, you're trained in various different things. When, mm -hmm. you, when you get to your SEAL team, everyone's trained up in a lot of the basic things. Everyone's a combat diver. You do land warfare. You do parachute jumping. It has, has a name fits Sea, Air, and Land. Right, you do right. all the specialties, that are, all the special warfare tactics mm -hmm. that go with that. Later on in my career, I specialized more in being sniper training, sniper instructor. But overall, the main thing that I'd, I'd say that I did is I was the leader first, first and foremost. Above all the other specialties, I was, I was the leader, the one making decisions and uh, executing those decisions. Uh, you mentioned being a sniper trainer. Is that what you said a second ago? In, instructor. In, instructor. Okay. Instructor. That's a place where the SEALs do get a lot of recognition. What separates the best Navy snipers from other precision rifle teams in the world? I don't know if there's a real distinction behind them. I think going to sniper school, there, there are a lot of great shooters, a lot of great rifle shooters. Mo most, if not all SEALs, I think are expert shooters. So everyone has the capability right. to go through the sniper training. What you get out of that training, though, is ju you're just going to think differently. You're going to look at targets differently. You get planning on it. You get strategic thought processes. Strategic in the sense that how you were going to go about going against mm -hmm. a target. So in, in an operational sense, how am I going to go do this? And you get leadership skills out of it because mostly the sniper guys, you're solo in a lot of things where you got one partner with you and you're going to go out and do certain operations. So instead of having a larger team, a much, much smaller team. So that, that's really what you learn, how to operate across the whole battle space, just you and your, and your shooting partner to accomplish a mission. Well, you did say that sometimes you're solo. It, I mean, I've obviously never been to sniper training or any precision rifle schools, but I think that is pretty common that there's a team there, but the solo aspect, I think, is definitely a little bit different, you know? Yeah, certainly, and you're, you're never really alone. In the team environment, you're never really alone. You, and you have support. Mm -hmm. you, you have your teammates that, that are going to be close by. But it, what you also learn at the sniper schools, a lot of times it's just you, and you have to rely on you and, and what you bring internally to that problem set. And the sniper school really helped hone that down to you're the one making all those decisions. Um, and that was invaluable to me. What's something that you might have wished you knew before you entered the Navy? I think things have changed considerably since you entered the Navy. Does anything stick out in your mind? You know, with 2020 hindsight looking back, yeah, so there's a, and many a number of things I wish right, I would right. have known. At the moment, when I, where I was, I was learning everything I possibly could. I was reading all the books, looking at everything, talking to everybody that I could possibly talk to about what I was getting into. So at the moment, which you know was 30 something years ago, I felt I was the, as most prepared as I could. Of course, from what you see on the outside and when you really get to the program, it, it yeah, things, things is change. completely yeah. different. Of course, because you know, there's be a lot of hype and a lot of publicity to it, but when you get to it, you're just like, whoa, this is totally different than what I thought that it was. Oh, in a good way, of course. Uh, certain, certainly much harder because then it all becomes, it all becomes just very real. And your commitment really takes more of a tangible form to, okay, here I am, here's a decision you made and you're going forward with it. Do you think that most SEALs have a calling for that kind of sense of purpose that you're talking about people coming into whenever they arrive on the teams? I believe so, because given the nature of the training, the training's really intense. There's some 75, 80% people that come into the training, all of them thinking they have what it takes, don't get through for one reason or another. And the process is going to weed that out of you. There are no shortcuts to BUDS training, basic underwater demolition seal training. There are no hacks for it. The process is you go there and you perform better than you did the day before. And you, you just don't simply meet the minimum standards. You need to excel those standards. Excel those standards are not only what the program sets for you, but what you set for yourself internally, about you internally 
growing and moving forward every day. Yeah, I think yeah, that does make a lot of sense that your own internal calling or however you phrase that is, I think, what pulls people to the teams and then to wherever they end up in the teams, whether it's they continue on and be. It is a calling about, it's about service. Service above, above oneself, service to complete strangers, to your fellow countrymen. Those people that are gonna walk by you on the street and look at you and not even think twice about you, not knowing what you're doing for them mm -hmm, on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis and really being okay with it. It's okay right, that, right. that you don't know. It is a, a much higher calling of service. So we spoke with Ed Byers a few weeks ago and I asked him a question that I think that is maybe appropriate to talk to you about too. I've learned a lot about the camaraderie and the mechanics of being on the SEAL teams in terms of what is required of them and there's also the external impression that you're talking about. People have an impression of what uh, these guys do and who they are and what they're about. But it contrasts a lot because I think there's a disconnection there. People realize or people believe that these are individuals or super, you know, superhuman individuals, but really there's so much more focus on the team and that is what really is defining, you know, the idea of the SEAL teams and all the people that are operating there. They put the teams above themselves, right? Are there parts in training or whenever you're on deployment that you rely more on yourself or does that change and is that ability to change back and forth between the two you think allow you to be a successful Navy SEAL or special warfare operator? So both SEAL and SWIC operators, really any special operator, the first person you, you have to lead. If you look at what you see from the SEALs in a SWIC is you see this big tactical side. You see the guys in the boats, the, the big guns, the fancy electronics, the state-of-the-art equipment that those guys, the really industry-leading equipment that they're using at mm -hmm. SWICs, and then the same thing that, at the SEAL teams. And then you see the, the image, the, the, the big burly guys doing right. all this dangerous and crazy stuff. That's really a small percentage of the things that we do. You also don't see the, the human side of what they do. Their husbands, their fathers, they are your little league coaches. They're your neighbor next door out there cutting their grass. There's still that human element there to it as well. And then the level of commitment that it also takes, you know, we kind of called it mastering the switch. The switch being, you're at home, you gotta throw the switch in one direction. I gotta be dad, I gotta deal with everything at home. And then you're gonna go throw the switch and you're gonna go to work. And then you have to take on this immense responsibility that it is to, to be in these organizations of doing what the nation is asking of them. And when you're in that mode, that is the priority. Your priority then isn't your family life, it is taking care of that much broader picture. And then the families are at home, still bearing that immense weight as well at home. They're not out doing that job physically, but emotionally they're still there doing it. And then they have to bear the burdens at home as well too. So immense challenging uh, task for, for those family members as well. So we call it, you have to be very good at mastering that switch. And you have to be very good at it as well when you're out doing your job, because there'd be one moment when you have to have a, what we call a very kinetic response and then switch right away into a very human response because maybe the situation warrants something other than this kinetic side. And very often that's the case. A person that can switch back and forth to being exactly what the situation requires. I think that in a way separates us from what a lot of other organizations do. Kind of had a feeling that is a unique challenge that only certain people are really able to do effectively, consistently, and well because that's obviously required in your job. Making that switch fast is part of the process. So it's, that's what I think really separates uh, the SEAL and SWIC training so from other training that's out there. So it's not necessarily the physical. Physical piece is really, that's gonna come pretty easy. You know, that'll come easy to most. It's that internal piece that's gonna be much more difficult. And when you are stressed, when you are in a very difficult situation, you are uncomfortable, you're exhausted beyond compare, and to be able to make those intellectual, critical thinking tasks and make them accurately, that is what this training is really going to prepare you to do. That, I believe that's what separates us. This, this training from, from other training is it's training that mental acuity in our people. I kind of define part of that as the grit. I think that's maybe the working side of that switch, right? Talk a little bit about 
how you've developed that in your life, or if that's even possible to develop, it's something that you're born with. So that, that's the, the great man question, right? Is a person born into the situation or does the situation make the person? And I think it's, it becomes a little bit of both. Right. You know, there's, a, there's an art and then there's the science piece of both things, or there's an emotion and a logic piece to all of it. You need absolute both of those things to move forward. There's a logic piece, which is cold, hard facts, then there's the emotion piece, which is your life experiences and things that you've been through. Both of those things you need to move forward to make the right decisions in life, not just in our role, but in any life. Right. I, I think that, yeah, I think that like foundational, right? Like, like you're saying. It is foundational. For me, that foundational piece came from scouting. Scouting was that Boy Scout oath, that Boy Scout law, and the other adult leaders that I was around. That's so why I think those those programs, you know, Girl Scouts, Boys and Girls Clubs, those things are very very important to our youth because it just gives you some foundation. The, the and challenges place, you, I think, too. It does challenge you. At a young age, here you're going to take our youth. You're going to put your sights on a long goal, a long task. It's going to take several several years, four or five, maybe six years, to attain the rank of Eagle Scout. And you're young, and you're making a commitment there. So at an early age, you're getting used to responsibilities, thinking through things, making a commitment, and uh, yeah, that, following through, yeah. And following through, so you're getting that grit, you're getting that resilience, and there's a lot of difficult tasks, and a lot of things are placed on those, those young kids in order to complete this task. And it really, it is just a primer, the way I looked at it, scouting for me, it was just a primer for citizenship. I wouldn't have traded that for anything. Yeah, that's huge. I, I don't think enough people are involved in those types of organizations, not necessarily them specifically, but from a young age, especially I think in today's climate that challenging your kids with potentially dangerous things, you know, giving your kid a pocket knife when they're six years old or whatever the age is, you know what I mean? Stuff like that is kind of almost sounds outdated to a lot of people, which I think is really kind of naive to think that. Those things are at the very core of the very fabric of who we are as a nation. You know, the, the pocket knife stuff, they're out there. Let's teach the kid how you're gonna use this thing so yeah, you safely, don't cut right, yourself, yeah. right? Or an ax, like the basic things I look at Boy Scouts, aside from the character that it develops. Fire starting, mm -hmm. you know, first aid and, and tie a knots. You're gonna look at a Boy Scout and say, Here, here's someone that, hey, that kid that's over there standing in that Boy Scout uniform 10 years old, he could save your life. He knows how to do CPR, he can stop you from bleeding. A kid can absolutely save your life because of the training that he's been through. So yeah, and his mind knowing that he just even taking any action is he, what stops a lot of people. I would imagine. So that, that you know? then becomes he can look at the situation and go, I need to intervene there. Right? I see something going on. I have the courage in me to do something, and I have the skills to go and do something. And that's all when you see in a, in a little ten-year-old boy standing there. And the same goes for Girl Scouts as well, too. So you have Girl Scouts do the exact same thing that Boy Scouts are going to do. You know, we don't look at our youth as being, oh, that kid, what could that kid do? Well, that kid can do a whole lot, let me tell you. Yeah, I think the responsibility piece is really huge because I think kind of giving people that permission to take responsibility and ownership at a young age, that is something that people don't realize that maybe they can even do, whether they're allowed to do, and then it's kind of getting them off jump start almost. It is, and the accountability. Right, that you're accountable for your actions, something we don't have a lot. Right, right. If you never became a SEAL, what kind of could you see yourself doing other than, than that in your life? Maybe uh, as a kid, do you have any other ambitions or? Looking back on it now, really I can't see myself of doing anything else. Right. You know, to go back to the, the yeah, great, yeah, yeah. Man, great man theory, is a person born or not? Like any youth, yeah, I had my dreams. Hey, okay, you want to be a fireman or you want to go right. be a jet fighter pilot or you want to go be architect or doing engineering. And you sort through all those things. And you have to go through that process to saying, okay, what do I want, right? right? Kind of the why and is it true of each of these things? And then you kind of say, okay, this one right here looks the most appealing to me. I'm feeling this one is, is right for me and it's the right thing to do. And that's kind of where I was at. I made that decision that, hey, that Navy is the right place for me to go. And um, yeah, very difficult life, but I have not looked back once. Yeah, I kind of expected that answer, but I figured I would have to ask anyway, sure. just to see if you might uh, give us a little gem, like, you know, you want to be a race car driver or something like that, like yeah. get your hidden hobby. No ballet dancer. No ballet dancing. You never know. I mean, I've met people across the board with the Navy SEALs. I'm sure you could do it, I'm sure. It's like, not much you guys can't do. I don't know how I'd look in tights. I can foxtrot, though. Can we talk a little bit about fear and getting over fear? What are your best strategies for getting over fear? So fear is very common very common reaction, and it's normal. Everybody feels fear. Everyone is, is afraid. Everybody does. If there's a 
seal that's out there, there's a sweat guy out there that's gonna say, look, I'm, right, I'm fearless, then they run away from that person. True courage, and uh, I think there are several quotes out there. One of them, I think, um, comes from a fictional John Wayne. Mm -hmm. you know, the true courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway, right? That's, that's like, look, I'm scared. Right, I embrace it. Like I'm no, like I'm not. I'm not going to hide it. Yeah, I'm scared to go do this. But what I'm getting ready to do, absolutely needs to be done right now. True courage comes from being scared and doing the thing that you're about ready to do anyway. Knowing you recognize the risk, you know there could be a very terrible outcome, but you're going to go do it anyway. Because the outcome, if you don't do something, would be much worse. So recognizing there's a situation there recognizing you can have an impact, a positive impact on what's going on there, and then making the decision to go and doing it. The, the strategies that you're gonna have are gonna come from the core of who you are as a person. The things you believe in, the things in your life that you will do, the things in your life that you know you will not do, and then living them. So, yeah, it's... Identifying, I think, some of those belief systems, I think, or but the priorities, I think is what gets in the way of now hearing you say that because if there's no sense of urgency, then I'm not gonna do it, I'm scared. No, there's no need to do it, right? Or if it's something that's more personal, you need to have that definition for yourself, what you're willing to do, what you're willing not to do, what your goals are to be able to say, I'm gonna have to push through this. Do you think that's kind of a big part of it? For SEAL training, for, for the SWIFT training, it, it is a big part of it because although you're going through as a group, you're gonna have a, a group of teammates that are around you going through SEAL training. But what the training is going to do is it's going to break down that team a little bit, but it'll, it really is going to get down to the core of who you are as a person. You know, all those little things, there's only so much that team effort is going to get you through. But remember, a team is built up of a lot of individual right. great efforts. And you take those individual great efforts and put them all together, and those together, they go off and they do great things. If you have people there just doing mediocre, meeting the minimum standards, well, that, that's not really a team. Certainly not a high-performing team, right. which is the ones that we have. So those people that are just meeting the minimum standards, those are the ones we simply don't want around, the people that are exceeding those standards. So you absolutely need to have someone that's gonna dig deep inside them and say, okay, this is the way that we're gonna go, or I'm not giving in, I'm not gonna quit today. My body's hurt, I'm in pain so is the person right next to me, and the thing we're doing right now is really worthy of doing, and we're gonna go do this. Yeah, that, I think that's something that people don't realize about the teams, is that there's lots of different personality types, but what really connects them is the core. You know that the other person, at that stage, when you guys are finally put together, like, we're on the same page. Is, do you think that's accurate? So it, it is accurate. So being like-minded, yes, we've, we've all been through the same experiences, that we've all been through the same trainings. We're like-minded is that we're very, I don't want to say singularly focused, but we're very mm -hmm. committed right. to, to, to this action, what we're doing. We have a term that, hey, it's, we're all in on this. And that term's used very freely today, but no one really understands what this really means is that when I'm all in, I'm here with you right now, 100% of me yeah, is your here, life, not just right? Yeah, well, you're, I'm here with you, yeah, my right. life. My life, what equals my life is not just my heartbeat, right? It's my mm -hmm. soul, it's my mm -hmm. heart, it's my dreams, it's my family's hopes and dreams and, and all the things that they could become. All the next birthdays, all the, all the events, those are the, all the things that we are going to give up, willing to give up for you. Go see my kids, go get married. You know, just experience that living and not existing. I'm gonna give all that up for you, right, my fellow citizens. And that's, that's really, that's what's at risk here. When we say all in, like I am, I'm all in on doing this to protect by fellow citizens. I understand that you spoke with a BUDS class earlier today. Yeah, what was that experience like? What did you talk to them about? So I spoke with BUDS class 332. They are about a week out from Hell Week, so they just finished Hell Week, and I think there was about 90 of them in there. An amazing experience. I haven't spoken to a BUDS class, been that close to a BUDS class since I myself went yeah, through. Right. So it was really almost another surreal moment for me. I'm standing there in front yeah. of them all, and I can really picture myself in their seat you know, seeing like, well, mm -hmm. I, I've been right there. So uh, I talked to them a little bit about my experiences going through Hellwick and the things that I remembered. And, you know, I told them, I said, you know, this is just a primer. You just went through Hell Week. You've not arrived. You're not done yet. You got a long road ahead of you. But just like I was mentioned earlier, 
Whole Week is just a little primer for you to get tapped into the resources within you that you're going to need to go forward with the rest of your career. So yeah, you're going to be sleep deprived, you're going to be in pain, you know, discomfort, you're going to be hungry, you're going to be angry, you're going to be sad, you're going to be all those things. But guess what? Inside of all of that, you still have to function and how best do you do it. That's what I told them. This is really what the purpose of all this is here. You're doing a lot of things maybe you don't make any sense of. And maybe by Thursday, you don't remember the things that you're doing. But this is the purpose of it, to tap into you, the internal piece of you, of who you are, to say, yeah, I can get through all this stuff. And I can get my teammate through all of this stuff. And he's going to get me through all of this Give stuff. Give them a little bit of a reality check, a little it's bit. Just kind of a little reality check. Say it's an, and I mentioned to them, yeah, we have that logo that you mentioned in the beginning of this podcast. It says the only easy day was yesterday. Well, I believe words have meaning. Each word has a definition. And they, they're put together a certain way to, to get away a certain emotion. Everyone has different definitions to certain words. To me, the only easy day was yesterday. And this is what I told the class, is I don't care what you did yesterday. I really told them this, is you may have saved the President of the United States' life yesterday. Great, good on you, you got two minutes, get over it, you did a good job. What are you gonna do for me today, right? What are you gonna do to top it? So that's what I told them. I said, hey, pat yourselves on the back. You got two minutes to get over it and then focus on what the next task is ahead. So those are the things that I, that I told them. Congratulations on getting through Hell Week, right. but also my condolences, right? Because it's going to get much harder. Right? It never stops. I mean, even look at your career now, taking a change that unforeseen, you know, and you still developing, you still looking for. I think that's important to kind of recognize. And, and still serving. That, right. That's, that's right for me. A career for the SEAL and the SWIC, it progressively, it's going to get harder and harder and harder. The jobs and the tasks are going to put on you, they're progressively going to they're going to get harder. They're going to get more intense. That's the career path that, that our people that go through. I'd like to touch a little bit on adversity, and I think we kind of defined part of what enables you and I think most people to be able to push through that, and that's having a direct understanding of the purpose for why uh, you're in that position to begin with and having the vision to continue on. Are there any other aspects that you can add to that in terms of overcoming adversity? Any personal anecdotes or anything like So the I have several. The best one that I can give you, so the night in question where I received the, the Medal of Honor, the actions for. Mm -hmm. So you know, my helicopter was shot down. My teammate had fallen out. So I have a downed helicopter sitting in front of me. I made the decision that I'm going to take care of the problem in front of me. It's a downed helicopter. We got all those, that air crew got us all to a safe location, a secure, safe location. It was from that spot that I had a decision to make. You know, the weight of command, I was a ground force commander, and the responsibility on our commanders that are on the ground is incredible. It's uh, national strategic level commitments that are on those guys, the people going forward is sitting on their shoulders. So I had a decision to make. It's in that decision, it's in those, those moments when no matter what teammates are around you, Right, that leader has to bear that responsibility. You're gonna feel absolutely alone. And in that, that moment, I did feel alone. Although I had my teammates around me, had air crew around me, I felt absolutely alone with the critical decision I was going to make. And the decision to, for me to make was, do I go now back to the mountaintop against superior enemy numbers? They have heavier caliber firepower than I do. I am not outfitted. I don't have the equipment to do an assault. I was outfitted to do a different mission. And if I go now, there's a chance that I could rescue my teammate, or I could wait three, four hours for more reinforcements to come, and th that is the sure thing that I will go to the mountaintop, but it'd probably most likely be a, a recovery. Fully known if I go now, the chances of me myself perishing, I thought were 100%. I thought it was 100% of me losing more of my teammates. And at that moment, that piece that came back to me is what I learned as a youth. And those were the opening lines of the Boy Scout Oath. The opening lines are, on my honor, I will do my best to do my duty. On my honor, do my best to do my duty. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty. That echoed in my head as I'm sorting through all the tactical scenario of what I'm going to do. It's then when I started to listen to it about the third time, I was like, wow, okay, I've not done my best, and I'm gonna go do this. So that's when I briefed my team and said, hey, we're, we're going back and we're gonna go do this. So I can't stress to the listeners enough how important it is. The core of who you are, whatever it is that you believe in, 
that's vitally important for you going forward. How do you make decisions? What do you believe in? And can the problems you experience, if you throw them against whatever it is that you believe in, whatever ethos, whatever creed, whatever it is you belong, those things at their very core, Boy Scout Oath, all that stuff, they're just a tool for you to use to make decisions when decisions are difficult to come by. That's really at the basis of what they are, right? I got a bad problem right here, difficult decision to make. I'm gonna take that problem, I'm gonna throw it against whatever I believe in. For me, it was the Boy Scout Oath. For the Seal of Swick, it's the Seal and the Swick Creed. You're gonna take whatever problem you got, you're gonna throw it up against it. And if it sticks to it, guess what, I'm gonna go do it. If it bounces off of it, hey, maybe I probably shouldn't go do what I'm getting ready to go do. That's what I look at those things at their core. They're tools for you to make a decision. And they're not just for when you're in uniform, they're for your personal life as well. If you don't know what you believe in, if you don't know what your core ethos is, if you don't have one personally, then here's the SEAL one, here's the SWIC one. What that came from, it started in around 2000-ish, 2002, 2003, somewhere around there. That came from our entire lineage, from the first day down in Fort Pierce when the first frogmen were made to this present day. Every word in there, every phrase is fact. It happened in one form or another. So it is a bit ideal, but it is a factual thing that all stems from something that happened and we put it down in writing to say this is, this is who we are, this is what we believe in, this is how we'll conduct ourselves. That is what those ethoses are there for. In kind of stepping forward into the future after that event, what aspects did, in your personal life did you kind of rely on to gain that strength again to kind of push through in your personal life? So certainly after the event, when we came back off the mountain, immediately coming off the mountain, which was some 20 hours later, I walked into our planning and control center, you know, and I was, this is the point when I can finally, I can like, whoa, okay, breathe, that, right. I can breathe a little bit. And I walked into our command space and I just felt like I'm just exhausted. And I just felt like, wow, that, that was some pretty intense stuff that we just went through. I really didn't feel like I could move and go forward. And I'm standing in our command space and I still had all my gear on and this is when the teamwork stuff comes in. So my teammate was there in the room, recognized in me that I was, I looked defeated. And I was defeated, I felt right. defeated at this point. And a teammate who is a high ranking member of the community now, saw this in me. A great, he didn't say anything to me, he just came up to me. This is the, the definition of teammate comes in for me. He came up to me and he just embraced me. Didn't say anything and he just, just simple human gesture coming up to me, right, and embracing me and just telling me in this very brotherly way to say, look, it's gonna be okay, right, but get yourself straight, right, because I need you. And that's basically what he was telling me, right? And then he let me go and I go back to my tent and that's exactly just what I needed. So there'll be times, there'll be times when, oh man, I just can't, I can't take another step forward. That's when those teammates are gonna go, hey, look, I'm here for you. Right? We can do this together. So that was the immediate aftermath of that. And then moving forward, yeah, certainly still those core aspects that they're just going to remain. There's going to be difficult times. You have to always go back on who that is, who you were, what you believe in, uh, and they will carry you through. How do you suggest candidates take care of their mental and emotional well-being whenever they're really pushing themselves? Um, or, or even people that are deployed? So everyone is different. Everyone goes through experiences, things different. What might be stressful to me is not as stressful as someone else. So, right. so everyone's gonna be in a different situation. What I'd say in general, if you've made the decision that this is the path that you want to go down, whether it be SEAL, whether it be SWIC, you think through it all completely to say, why am I gonna go do this? Do I just want, to, I want a little piece of that image or do I, do I really wanna go out and I wanna serve at the highest possible levels with some of the best citizens that our country could produce. If the answer is yes to, to that, then go for it all in. And the other piece, the mental piece, once you've made that core decision and your reasons are sound, everything else is gonna come easier to you. You're gonna be able to pull from that because my reasons for being here are sound. The training process, the pipeline, all that stuff is just gonna pick you apart. Maybe you came in for one other reason because you bought into the image 
you hit the training process and you're like, oh my God, Things this change. is really terrible. What right. am I doing here? Worst decision of my life. And then you just hold on just a little bit longer. And then you hold on a little bit longer. You go one more day, one more day, and you're like, well, this really is what I want to do. So the initial thing I would say, once you make the decision for why are you into this? Why do you want to do this? And if you're in, then you're in. Don't give up on it. And if you're in it and you're having those thoughts, look, just, just wait another minute. Right? And go back to your core reasons. Why are you here? Why do you really want to do this? Take a look to your left. Take a look to your right and say, okay, this is, this is the reason why I'm here. For me, I look at our flag a little differently than a lot of people. And I, we, we used this analogy for many years. I'll pass it on to you guys. So it can be very difficult at times. You know, certainly a lot of things, that, a lot of stressful environments that, that we go through. But if you look at our flag, a lot of people look at our flag, they see the red, the white and the blue. The red symbolizes, you know, the blood and sacrifice that generations have given for the country. Right. The white, you know, innocence, purity, you know, m many other definitions. And the blue of the, the field is for justice. That's kind of how I look at it. And those things are very readily apparent when you, when you look at the flag. But the real core of our flag, when you look at it, is the thread that holds it all together. It's something that no one, no one ever pays any attention to. Right? And that thread passes in and out of all of that stuff, and you never see it. And you see the flag standing out through a hurricane, and the ends may be a little frazzled, a little torn, but the flag is still all together. All that we are as Americans is all tied up in that flag. And that thread is the only thing that's holding it all together. That thread is us. That's how I look at it. It's that thread. I'm going to get battered, I'm going to get bruised, I'm going to get beat up. But I know who I am. I know the things I will do. I know the things I will not do. I know my character's intact. This is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to hold strong. And that's what I see as our community is. We're the thread that's going to just hold everything together, no matter what it is you're going to throw against me. Thank you so much for sitting with us and spending some time with us. I know you've got your own life and a lot of other things that you, you got to do in your life. So appreciate you taking the time yeah. to speak with us. Yeah, ha very happy to be here. Thanks for the privilege. Find out more at sealswick.com and join us again for the next NSW podcast.